OpenAI's Surge GPT has definitely taken the internet by storm, but guys, there are still so many questions and so much speculation around this new AI search engine, and in this video, I'm going to cover five things that you need to know about Surge GPT right now, so be sure to stick around to the very end. So if this is your first time to the channel, welcome. My name is Ryan and my mission is to help you navigate the overwhelming world of artificial intelligence. And if you want to know my favorite AI tools and prompts that I use right now for marketing and content creation, be sure to get my free AI marketing essentials guide. You can find the link below this video, but now let's dive back into search GPT. So the very first thing I wanted to know when search GPT was announced last week is who all has access to this. And you'll see I have access. I am a member of chat. GPT plus and according to OpenAI it says all chat GPT plus and team users have access to this I would assume enterprise users fall in this category as well but here's something really interesting they also said as well as search GPT waitlist users and if you remember OpenAI launched this waitlist when search GPT was first announced and they had an option where you could sign up and I did sign up immediately I heard back that I wasn't on the first level of testing or beta testing whatever they ended up rolling out with but what I don't understand with all of this is it says search GPT waitlist users. It doesn't distinguish if you're a plus member, a free member. So if you guys are free members of Chad GPT, you signed up for the waitlist and you now have access to search GPT in your interface that looks like this. Let me know in the comments below because that is the number one thing I still don't know is who all has access to this. I would assume this will be rolled out to all free users eventually if OpenAI wants to compete with the likes of Perplexity, Microsoft Bing, slash Copilot, and even the Googles of the world, they're going to have to roll this out to free users eventually. But right now, that is who all has access to search GPT from what I understand. Now, in terms of access, another important thing to mention is that there is a Chrome extension available for ChatGPT search. I'll leave a link to this in the video description below. And if you add this to Chrome, I'll show you what this is, what this is going to do. I'm going to click add extension. And then right here, ChatGPT search has been added to Chrome. So if I open up a new tab and search for something like best smart TVs, if I do that again, what you'll notice right here is it says ChatGPT search search versus traditionally, it would just go straight to Google by default. So if I click this, what this is going to do is route it to ChatGPT and then do the search within search GPT. So that's what that Chrome extension does. Now, if I had to guess, Google will probably try to mitigate this because this is Google's platform, Google Chrome. Obviously, Google owns this. And the last thing that they want is to have a Chrome extension of people deferring Google traffic to search GPT traffic into OpenAI's ecosystem. So I would imagine Google will probably try to censor this or do something with this in the meantime. Um, but that remains to be seen. I'm actually going to remove this for now. I just wanted to mention that in terms of access. It's an important feature that you guys need to know. So the second thing you need to know about search GPT is monetization. In other words, how is OpenAI making money from this or are they even making money from this? And so if I come into search GPT by clicking the search mode, I'm going to type in something transactional, meaning I have potential intent to buy something from the internet. I'm going to do best smart TVs as an example. And it's giving me two options here, which is interesting. I'm just going to click response one. I haven't gotten the, the one or two response thing yet in search GPT. So I find that interesting, um, but I'm going to click response one. So we'll go with that. And what you'll see is a screen that looks like this, right? We have a list of all of these different smart TVs, and this will look probably similar to whatever the transactional query is that you type in best running shoes, best VPNs, things of that nature, where it has a list of all the different options. And then it links off to the different sources. And then you can also toggle the sources down here on the bottom where you get this screen on the right and it gives you about 10 different options here to choose from where it links off to other websites. Now, what is one thing that's missing from this screen that we are typically seeing on search engine results pages for transactional queries? The answer is search ads. So if we go to Google and type in best smart TVs, what I'm going to see, and I knew this was going to happen, what I'm seeing is a ton, a ton of different ads. These are shopping ads on top here that endlessly scrolls. These are what are called search ads right here. So we have all these different shopping ads. We have two search ads, and then we finally have the organic listings on Google. So before I even get the chance to scroll down on my desktop, it's all advertisements. Same with Bing search. If I type in best smart TVs on Bing search, what I notice right here 
it's all shopping ads. And look how far along that screen that it stretches. So if I scroll down, the organic placements are right here, which is really, or this is even an ad. So Bing ads actually hides the ad logo a lot you know, more sneakily than Google does in my opinion. Um, so right here, there's an ad and all the shopping ads. So what I'm trying to explain here is that there are no search ads currently on search GPT. And even if we come over to perplexity and type in best smart TVs, there probably isn't going to be any search ads on perplexity right now either. But here's the kicker. Perplexity announced that they will be adding ads in the fourth quarter. So what we're in right now as AI assisted search gains popularity. So perplexity is already going to add search ads in its results. And I would assume for mostly transactional queries. And it looks like we don't have search ads yet. Uh, there's some products here. Uh, looks like there's some sources. I'm not sure if Best Buy is actually paying for this or not, or if this is just the response that we got organically. It looks like just the organic response from Perplexity. So my hunch is that OpenAI will eventually add search ads. I just don't think they have the traffic or numbers to justify that when they're trying to compete with a behemoth like Google. If I'm a ChatGPT Plus user paying $20 a month, you have Teams users, Enterprise users paying more than that. The last thing I want to see to try to sway me to use search GPT over something like Google is ads in the search results. That is one thing that they're trying to differentiate themselves from Google right now. As if I go back to my first example, I can't even scroll down to find an organic unbiased opinion here. And so that's the selling point with search GPT right now is that there are currently no search ads. I would expect this to change in the future. Now, the third thing to know about search GPT is from my experience, there are different types of search intent that this performs better than other search engines versus other types of intent. So what exactly am I talking about? So for anything transactional, if I do, let's do best VPNs in this example. I do prefer the results for transactional searches like this inside search GPT than what you would get from something like Google. If I do best VPNs, what do we know? Four ads right on top here. And I can't even find an organic listing without scrolling down. And then here's the AI overview. So if I want, you know, my question answered, like if I want to go to Reddit or some of these other pages, I have to scroll down three or four times just to get there. Versus you come into a search GPT if I'm looking for the best VPNs and right here it lists it, it has a source for each one. It also has a two sentence snippet here, which I like on why this is rated one of the best VPNs according to search GPT. So when it comes to transactional searches, I do think right now because search GPT does not have search ads, it seems to me it's a little more unbiased than what you would get for a transactional search inside Google when it pertains to their ads across the board. I don't like their AI overviews for transactional searches. So that is another thing that you need to know. Now, in addition to transactional queries, I've actually enjoyed my results better for news related searches on search GPT compared to Google. So for example, if I click the search mode and I do, let's do top AI news today. I'm always looking at the top AI stories today. If you're in a different industry, you could obviously replace that for finance, agriculture, real estate, et cetera. Um, but right here we have our top news stories. As of November 3rd, here are the latest developments in artificial intelligence. OpenAI launches search GPT. Uh, there's about five stories here. And what I like about this, not only does it give like a one to two sentence snippet of each news story, it also links right to the source. And if I click it, it just takes me straight to the website, right? November 1st. So that's a very relevant story. And you can come down here and also toggle the sources like I showed you in a previous example. Um, so very recent stuff here. Now, if we head over to Google and do the exact same thing, what is the top AI news today? It's going to give me an AI overview. Now, some of these stories are obviously very relevant. It's recent. What I don't like, okay, there's like a one little short sentence of what it is. That's fine. But if I click the link, I would be expected to be taken to that source. So this is part of Google's game here, right? They're trying to keep you on their search engine as long as possible. So you click an ad, they can collect more data from you, things like that. Where if I click this, I now have to take another step to go and click this website. It might not seem like a lot to you, but as a user versus coming in here and just clicking the source and going right to it, and then it actually takes you on a new tab. I like that as well. 
versus Google, you have to take the extra step. I just find that frustrating. And if I come down here and click news, these are some of the top stories. But what the issue with this is, some of these stories could overlap, right? That's just the, the name of the game here with Google News. They could be talking about the same things. And so I just prefer for something like this, I prefer search GPT versus what I get from Google when it comes to things like news related searches. So another thing you need to know about search GPT relates to sources. Where exactly is OpenAI getting these search results from? And if I type in back to the example previously, top AI news today, again, you'll see the screen that we've seen in the previous example, all these different stories, and it links off to a source, New York Post, The Verge, Wall Street Journal, Vox, Time Magazine. The question is, where is OpenAI getting this from? There's no such thing as, you know, OpenAI Search Console, like we see in Google Search Console, where you can index your website or Bing Webmaster Tools. I've actually heard rumors that they are actually getting this from Bing search results and since Microsoft and OpenAI have that investor relationship. So if I do top AI news today and we compare results really quickly, I'm just curious to see what's going to happen. So we have Wired, TechCrunch. Um, actually, these results are quite different. I mean, maybe on the news it's, it's somewhat similar, but still it's different. Motley Fool, Forbes, uh, Business, whatever that is, I'm not really sure. But I'm just, yeah, that's really interesting to me how for this query, that's different. Obviously, this will change based on the query that you ask it. But where I'm going with this, and in this particular example, it makes a lot of sense. You'll notice here the sources, New York Post, Verge, Wall Street Journal, Vox, Time. Where is OpenAI getting this information from? Well, if you remember back, you know, several months ago, even last year, OpenAI started building these relationships with media publishers. We have Hearst. They're a huge media publisher who owns several magazine titles. Same with Condé Nast, who they partnered with. They partnered with Dot Dash Meredith, who owns People Magazine. I actually used to work there, side story. Uh, if you scroll down, we have Time Magazine, who was in that result that I just showed you. Uh, if we scroll down, there's even more. The Atlantic, Vox Media. So Vox was just in that result that I just showed you. Uh, News Corp, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many of these media publishers that OpenAI is partnering with. And if I had to guess, that is probably part of the reason why we see certain sources more than others. Again, it depends on the query, depends on the industry, the type of thing that you're searching. But it can't be a coincidence that all these different partnerships, and I say partnerships in, in parentheses and quotation marks, because in my opinion, this is OpenAI's way of establishing some precedent where they can eventually essentially take their content, re-spin it in their own words from Time Magazine, Vox Media, Dot Dash Meredith, Condé Nast, Hearst, et cetera, without experiencing lawsuits or legal trouble in the near future and years to come. That is why they're partnering with all these media companies. So that would be my hunch as to why certain publishers are showing up more than others. It has to do with these relationships that OpenAI is building in the background. So back to the original thing that you need to know, it's sources. Know that OpenAI is establishing partnerships with huge media companies, and we're likely going to see those companies in the search results versus what you would see on a Google or even a Microsoft Bing to some extent. So the last thing I think you should know about search GPT and in terms of its comparison to Google is that it is more conversational in terms of its user interface. So for example, if I type in a query like best VPNs, I now have the option to message chat GPT another question. Maybe you have, you know, a specific thing that you want to know about VPNs. So if I search for best VPNs and I scroll through and read all of these different results, I can then follow up and say, um, let's see if I have an Amazon fire stick, what is the best VPN for that device? And then let's see what it comes up with here. And then it's going to say for Amazon fire stick users, Nord VPN and other is express. So basically I'm having a conversation with it and I can ask it specific details. I can then say, um, great. Well, how do I install a VPN on my fire stick? And I'm having this natural conversation with it based on that first query of best VPNs. And here it gives me a step-by-step -step process. So it says install a VPN app from the Amazon App Store, install a VPN being an APK file or side loading, set up a VPN on your router, use a virtual router on your PC. And so it gives me the step-by-step -step option as I asked it a follow-up question. Or if I come to Google and type in best VPNs, you're just going to see one search result here of the best VPNs. By the way, there are four ads and an AI overview, which I'm not a fan of. But there is no way to have a conversation with this. Now, I could come back and say, 
um, what are the best VPNs for Fire Stick? And it'll give me another result. But again, four ads right here. This is not a naturally flowing conversation or more helpful to the user, in my opinion, versus what I just did here. And again, I can come back and say how to install a VPN on my Fire Stick. But what's interesting, again, three ads right here, along with an AI overview. So the experience of trying to be conversational with Google is not even close, in my opinion, right now, and not as helpful to this example that I just showed you inside Search GPT. Now, something else quick to call out on this topic of Search GPT being more conversational compared to Google is that if you remember OpenAI and ChatGPT has the ability to remember or memorize your previous chats. So I asked it here, now remember this conversation for the future when I need your help. And it says, I understand you have an Amazon Fire Stick, may have questions about VPNs in the future. Feel free to ask anytime I'm here to assist you. Versus Google, yes, they can know your search history, only if you're signed into an account though. If you're on a private browser and you're not even signed in, there's no way to follow back up with it and say, hey Google, remember how I told you I have a VPN and an Amazon Fire Stick and I need help with this, this, and this? It's not going to remember that. Versus ChatGPT, it now remembers this conversation and you can use this context for however you want for future chats, right? So just something that I wanted to call out there. Now, I know there's a million other things I could talk about on the topic of Search GPT, but I want to know what you guys have to think. Did I miss anything important about Search GPT? Are there any questions that you have? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. Again, if you've made it this far to the video, I appreciate you. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel if you found value. But most importantly, I hope you all have a great day.